Father, we thank you for the holy hour that you are ordained for the ministry of the world. Send down our Holy Spirit, enable us to discern who the God we worship and help us to worship our God in truth and in spirit. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One day I was traveling in a suburban train when I was lucky to find a place near the window. And I found a very devout Catholic sitting in front of me with his uh, uh, prayer beads in his hand and his mouth was reciting the prayers as the train went on. His face looked very serene and he was, I can see that he was praying but he was just observing everyone around but his mouth continued to pray. I also had another person sitting beside me who was having a very heated conversation on his mobile phone with some, some other person and uh, listening to the one side of the conversation I could understand that he is talking to his wife and they are having a conversation or quarrel over the commitment they have for their in-laws. And uh, this quarrel had been going on for some time. But what struck me is this, that whenever the train crossed the location of any temple, he took the mobile phone from his ears, paid obeisance to the temple and then again he put the mobile phone back and continued his quarrel. And this happened six or seven times as the train went on. Every time a temple is crossing, he will pay obeisance uh, and then he will continue. For the first person, the world is a temple. He understood that he is living in a world which is immersed in the presence of God. Even though a couple of churches passed by during the travel, that did not disturb his serene prayers. But for the second person, the presence of God is tied to particular locations. Only when that particular location came, he was alerted about, the, about God or his presence, or when he, only when he saw any temple towers or structures, he was uh, uh, conscious of the presence of God. Worshipping God in truth and in spirit is a theme for this day. And the Samaritan woman asks an igniting question. Our four parents worshipped in this mountain, but you say that we have to go and worship in Mount Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Why? And Jesus answered say, saying, neither here in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Jesus negates both the locations. We should understand that God never wants to be localized. God never wanted to be localized in a particular location or identified with any particular location. God is a God who is always with you and he is on the move wherever you go. God did not want a temple to be constructed in his name, first of all. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 6, the chapter which was just previous to the lesson that we read in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel as chapter 6, David brings the Ark of the Covenant with much celebration, dancing, fanfare. And he brings it to a location called Jerusalem. And he first localizes the God by bringing it to the Mount of Jerusalem before constructing uh, uh, the temple. And I think that is the worst thing that happened to the idea of God for the people of God. That is the worst thing that happened. 
because the very ark of the covenant is a symbol of an itinerant god god who is always on the move you can take the ark of the covenant which symbolizes that god is with you you can walk to the down the valley up the mountain cross the rivers god is with you and you can go into the battle with the ark of the covenant where god is with you the people of god won many battles with the ark of covenant with them the very symbol of the ark of covenant is that god cannot be localized god is a moving god a god who is mobile who is always with you and when ark of the covenant was brought to jerusalem the idea of god was tied to that one particular location and worst of all when solomon constructed a temple and locked up the ark of the covenant inside the holy of holies and rang a curtain in front of it none could see the ark of the covenant that is a worst of all god was locked up in the holy of holies uh, people thought god is only there but just listen to what god says in second samuel chapter 7 verse 6 and 7 when david proposes that he wants to build a house of cedar for the lord god protests have you not been traveling with you up and down with all the leaders of the tribes have i ever once asked them why you have not built me a house of cedar have i ever asked them why do you want to build me and lock me up there the ancestors of the people of god understood god as a god who is always with them they never cared for any temple wherever they went they just assembled a few stones and then sacrificed to god and they felt the presence of god all over traveling along with them and there is one word that strikes me very much uh, very um, significantly and that is genesis chapter 17 verse 1 when god says i am the lord god and you walk before me and be blameless he tells abraham who is first called i am the lord god you walk before me and be blameless and the hebrew tells literally the hebrew tells live before my eyes walk before my face living in somebody else's watch living under somebody else's watch means accepting to the rules and regulations laid by that person god tells abraham literally walk before me and be blameless accept my rules regulations my laws my commandments and be blameless that's what i ask you i don't ask, want you to go to any particular location and celebrate and to ancestor jacob god promised in genesis 28 15 saying know that i am with you and will keep you wherever you go and when moses was hesitant to take the israelite lead the israelites across the wilderness in exodus chapter 33 verse 15 god said from mount hebron my presence will go with you this is a god which cannot be contained within a temple or within a church however magnificent that structure is the people of israel thought that they have constructed a magnificent structure very big structure wonderful structure in the in the days of solomon and they thought that god will be very happy to come and live take an abode in the temple of jerusalem that solomon had built but god cannot be contained in that little temple that's what is the vision of isaiah that we have read today isaiah chapter 6 verse 1 says i saw the lord sitting on a throne high and lofty the hem of his robe filled the temple the temple is not enough even to fill the hem of his robes he cannot contain god in a temple temple of jerusalem they thought that it is a grandeur and great temple great ar- architectural feat but it is not enough even to contain the hem of god god of israel never wanted to be localized but in history during the times of david the kings god's name and god's presence was so much localized to jerusalem and its temple that 
when the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, came and destroyed the temple of Babylon, the temple of Jerusalem, and he declared that my god, Babylonian Marduk, has defeated your god, Yahweh. And people were so shocked, self shocked, that this could happen to a place where God lives. And when the captives were taken across the wilderness, they sang a very sorrowful song. When they were asked to sing, they said, how can we sing a Lord's song in a strange land? So much popularized by Boney M. But what these captives did not know is that no land is a strange land for our God who created heaven and the earth. No land is a strange land for God who is mobile, on the moon, wherever you go. And Ezekiel, in 10th chapter, tells the captives who were in Babylon, saying, The glory of God has departed Jerusalem and has come to you. Ezekiel chapter 10 tells how the glory of God with wings fluttering departs from Jerusalem and goes to stay with the captives in Babylon. No land is a strange land for this God. During Jesus' time, King Herod built the second temple and it was a temple of ethnic pride and uh, political power. Jesus was never at peace whenever he went to Jerusalem or inside the temple. He always was at loggerheads or quarreling with someone there or someone came to quarrel with him. He, he always left Jerusalem or the temple of Jerusalem without any peace. And that is why he says in Luke chapter 21, 6, saying, As for these things you see, the day will come when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. Jews were very furious that how can this Galilean carpenter and Galilean upstart can say such things about the abode of God, which was built so magnificently. But God's Lord's word became, came true 40 years later when Titus and Vespasian, the commanders of uh, the Roman army, came and destroyed the temple of Jerusalem for the second time until today it is not built. Till today it is not built. Any temple or any church which does not symbolize the governance of God, either in our personal life or in our corporate life, often falls into the hands of satanic forces which seek to dominate our lives. And Samaritan woman knew this, and that is why she asked and challenged the Lord, saying, how can anyone go on um, worship God in that Jerusalem? a place of bias and bigotry where even Jew Jewish women are not allowed inside the presence of God. Gentiles are not allowed. Samaritans are hated. How can that temple be a temple of God? That is a Jewish temple, not a temple of God. And Jesus replied saying, not in this location, nor in Jerusalem, but Anyone who wants to truly worship God will worship him in truth and spirit. The worship, if it has to be true, must allow God to rule over your spirit and your heart. Only that heart, only that human spirit which allows God to rule over you can truly worship God. And only a heart which accepts the rule of God is a perfect abode of God. And listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. And I found the good news translation very apt to what I want, what I am trying to say. I, and I read from good news translation. But the time is coming and is already here when the power of God's spirit but when by the power of God's spirit, people will worship the Father as he really is, offer him, offering him the true worship that he wants. God is spirit. And only by the power of his spirit can people worship him as he really is. 
And we have a Bible called Geneva Bible, which is a product of the Protestant Reformation. It was very popular bef before King James Version came into being. It was read by all the eminent literary literarians. Uh, this Geneva Bible has a footnote for verse 23 and 24 saying that the spirit that the Lord speaks is not the third person of Trinity. It's not the Holy Spirit, but it is the nature of God. It is the nature of God. Understand who God really is. So understanding who God really is and offering the worship that he wants is what we are going to take home today. Any worship that helps us to realize who God is, any worship that helps us to respond by resolving to live as God expects us to live, that is a true worship and that is the worship in spirit. Our God is not a God who can be mesmerized by singing. Our God is not a God who can be satisfied by the offerings that we bring. Our God is not a God who can be satisfied by the eminent, uh, exorbitant structures we build. And any structure that is built, any offering that is given and any song that is sung, without realizing who God really is, he is an anathema to God. Without understanding who God really is, without understanding what God's nature is, and without understanding what God's expectations are, our worship can never be a true and spiritful worship. Listen to what Psalm says in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a bro broken spirit. A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. A true worship hails from a heart not filled with self-importance or boastfulness. A true worship can never hail from a heart which is filled with self-importance and boastfulness. Only a heart which is broken a heart which realizes its own self sinfulness and a heart which realizes the sacredness of God in whose presence we have come. Only that heart will raise true worship to God. And uh, Paul is giving even more graphic description of what is acceptable worship to God in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, when he says, I appeal to you, sisters and brothers, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but discern what is the will of God. Present to your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to this world, but discern the will of God. He nails it in perfectly and firmly. True worship is one which helps you to discern the will of God and the ways of God. And true worship is one which helps you to resolve that henceforth this rule of God this will of God will rule over you. True worship is not connected to any location or any place. Whenever we are, wherever we are present, we are called to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And so, only a church which resolves to discern the will of God can offer its worship as a living, holy, and acceptable sacrifice to God. Only a heart and spirit which allows God to rule can worship God truly. Only that heart will be a true temple of God. Only the worship of the church where God is God's rule, only the worship of the church where God's rule is allowed to reign will be acceptable to God. Only the worship of church which realizes its sinfulness 
which realizes its own sinfulness and the sacred nets of God before whom it congregates, only that worship of that congregation will be acceptable to God. Only a church which resolves to discern the will of God can offer its worship, holy, acceptable, sacrifice to God. Know God who he really is. Allow God to be enthroned in your heart. Accept God's ruling in your lives. Worship God in truth and in spirit.